Well, let it not be said that we we don't start on time around here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for his blessing on our time here together. Heavenly Father, we come expecting tonight, Lord God, expecting to hear your voice, Lord. We're going to learn, Heavenly Father, about your plan, your purposes, the things that you're about, Lord. And we want to see how they apply to our lives here today. These things that we're going to study were took place thousands of years ago and were written thousands of years ago, Lord, because they were breathed by your Spirit. There's a place in our heart for them. There's a reason, Father God, that you gave us uh, this history, this this of these men and women that we're meeting, Father. And I ask you to open our hearts and uh, Lord God to learn from their lives and how they lived, Lord, before you in, in truth and in honesty and faith. So we ask you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have looked so far at um, chapters 1 through 11, which has given to us a very general overview, the beginnings of the history of man and the origins of and uh, not just the earth, but the universe, the cosmos, if you, you know, prefer that word. So we've looked at God's great dream and how it turned into God's nightmare, right? And the thing that came in to break or to break what God said would come, death, was the fact that man rebelled against God. He failed the test, right? He failed the test. drawn in, crossed the line that God had established, and set or set humanity on a particular course. And we saw how that course uh, played out. We saw that God's conclusion of the matter was that every imagination of the heart of man was evil from his beginning. He said that the earth was filled with violence. And that was really one of the, one of the uh, things that God noted uh, about the earth and about the condition of man, the way that men and women were were treating one another. It was it was a bi world, and if we look at our world today, uh, I think per perhaps in particular with some of the going on in our country, we're seeing kind of a, a type of lawlessness. But you have to realize there there were no structures at this time. There were no governments at this time. There were no uh, armed forces. There were no police forces. There were no courts. There were no prisons. It was just every man doing, as as later on, every man doing according to his own mind, according to his heart. He was acting out of his heart. And, and the way people, without restraints, act towards one another is when you do me wrong, the law, the law that is is eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You do me wrong, I do you wrong. There's no mediation. It's just vengeance. And vengeance is a violent thing. And so the earth was, was filled with that, and God looked down on it. As, as we saw, he said, this, I, I have to check this. I have to check this evil. And uh, I'm going to destroy it. It's come into my heart. And, and we saw the, the grieving in the heart of God over um, uh, the destruction, really, of humanity of his of, of his creation it, it, it was deteriorated immediately so he's death is going to enter and it did it began to take all kinds of crazy forms starting with murder in chapter four right you see brother rising up against brother i mean how often do you hear of that actually at I had some neighbors that that actually happened to. <laughs> Brother took a bat to the sister, poof, killed her over, over some finances. And yeah, kind of a horrible thing. But um, so we saw how, how, how one man, <laughs> one man got God's, what's his name? Noah, right? Thank God. Noah. A man who was just, a man who preached righteousness, a man who did what he could to bring people to God. While he was building this, 
this huge ark for approximately 70 years and people were walking by saying, you're crazy. No, but God has spoken. And, you know, we saw uh, the parallels with that, with how we live today, that, that we're building that Noah's ark. We're the ones that are calling people to repentance, calling people to come to Christ, calling people, you know, and people are looking and saying, but why? <laughs> Things are just normal. It's the way they've always been. No, there's more to it. You know, there's, 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 there's uh, evidences that God has been here, that he's visited, that he was crucified for us. He's given us his word and et cetera, et cetera. And we're pleading with men to come to Christ. And unfortunately, I, well, I think we're doing better than Noah did, you know. But nonetheless, when you consider the mass of humanity, we're, 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 we're winning really a remnant, a small uh, portion of mankind. So we saw how that even after the flood, uh, after that approximately 14-month flood history, that they left the flood and uh, uh, left the ark, rather, after the flood and the earth had dried up that work and uh, left a testimony to man. But uh, the strange thing is that you see is that immediately the cycle starts again. Immediately you see Noah planting a, a vine and getting drunk and his son shaming him and then openly confessing, you know, ah, look at what dad did, blah, 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 and, you know, went, went on about this and, and shamed his father. And then his father cursed him and, and that really set particular on a collision course that have really been at odds with one another since that time right? And the Arabs. And, and you see that, that it, it occurred way back then and really set the course of history. And um, from that particular point, we saw how it evolved into the forming of nations, where God dispersed the peoples that were gathered there, that were born of Noah uh, and, and of Noah's family. We saw how they were gathered there when they wanted to raise, and God said, no, that can't happen. I'm going to confound the languages and disperse you all into the various parts of the world, which is where we get all of our ethnicities from, right? That's why we have Africans and we have uh, Asians and we have Caucasians and we have whatever um, that's out there. They were dispersed by God. And uh, so we saw that. But now we're coming to a, a narrowing, if I can say it, of, of God's plan, of God's purpose. He began right after May with that verse in, in Genesis 3.16 where he said, there's one coming who's going to crush your head, speaking to the serpent, speaking to say, he's going to crush your head, right? And that was a very general prophecy that I'm sure nobody at the time <laughs> you know, could have possibly understood. But he knew exactly what he was going to do. And there, that was the beginning of history. We had seen unto that point creation history and the, and, and, and the fall of man, but then God initiated way back then this creation salvation, or this, this um, creation history out for man. But now we're going to come to where God is going to zero in on a particular man, and he's going to raise up a particular seed by that man. He's going to allow him to have a family, and the family is going to become nations. And those nations and those people are going to breed kings, and those kings are going to become a full nation. And even though it's a tiny nation, <laughs> it's a trigger nation, if I can say it that way. It's that you always have eyes on. You always have to see what's going on, and I believe you all understand I'm talking about the nation of Israel talking about the, the Jews and talking about how God used them. Well, it all had a starting point. It all had a beginning point. This is what we discover in Genesis, right? The beginning points of these particular things. And the, one of the interesting things, of course, that we find out about God's selection is that this is an old man. <laughs> this is not a young man. This isn't a 30-something something, a 50-something. This is a guy who's already passed his prime. This is a guy whose wife is already past his prime. And God said, God approaches this man. He says, look, I'm into league with you. I want to 
agreement with you. I want to uh, begin a friendship with you, and I want to use you to bless the whole world. All the families of the world are blessed in you. What do you think? I mean, can you? basically what happened that that you particular man I want to set you aside and he like Noah and Enoch before him took God at his word and even though he was old and even though he really physically couldn't produce what God had said he would produce neither his wife, he took him at his word. And because he became what we would call the, the father of faith, he, his life became a focal point, not just to bring in the, the eventual seed of the Lord Jesus Christ through, the, through the, the lineage of David and so on and so forth, and we'll talk about some of those, those things later on, but, uh, but he, he became an example you and me. He became an example for somebody to emulate, somebody that we can imitate or copy, not in a mechanical way, but by looking at his life and meditating on his life and thinking on his life and how he related to God and the, 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 the way that he spoke to God and the way that their friendship began and evolved and, and, and how he learned of God. One of the things, you, you see, he, he is this guy. He wasn't the first. Right, as I mentioned, there was Enoch who was, who was a marker, but we have like one verse on Enoch. Somebody asked me the other day, you want, I think it was John Robinson. Yeah, I mentioned Enoch. He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I want to learn about Enoch. I said, well, there's really like two verses about Enoch. There's really just nothing there. The fact that we know he pleased God and God snatched him. And we know that he pleased God because he walked in what? Faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. You cannot please God without faith, without believing in Him. About taking God, if I can just bring it down to a real simple level, taking God at His word. And that sounds like something that's very easy, but it's not. If we look at ourselves and the relationships that we have with ourselves, even the ones that we know the most, we find it difficult at times to take somebody at their word. We just have doubts. We just question. It could be because of past circumstances. Maybe there was a lack of honesty and there was a rupture in the trust bond. That, that occurs all the time. And sometimes it's very difficult to regain that trust. We have to learn to trust somebody we've never even seen. And not just trust Him with simple things, but trust Him with our very existence. Trust Him with our life. Trust Him with So that when He even leads us to places and things that to us look uncertain, scary, and frightful, and so on and so forth, we can put our hand in His hand and continue to walk with Him knowing that He's with us. Even though we've never seen Him. <laughs> but He's like the wind, right? You've never seen him, but you've seen the effects of his presence amongst us. You've seen the change in your own heart. You've seen the change in your own life. But it's not easy. It's not an easy walk. And it wasn't an easy walk for Abraham. Actually, I'll use his first name, Abram. Right? Some of you probably have noted the fact first in the chapters 12 through 17, well, through 16, he's known as Abram. And then later, God changes his name to Abraham, right? The first is a singular, Abram, prince, and then it's prince of peoples or father of peoples. And, and in Hebrew, the im is just, is just how you add the plural to it. So, one of the wonderful things that uh, I like is that God doesn't hide the defects of the people he gives to us as examples. Because all the people that we see in the Bible, except Jesus, <laughs> were full of defects. I mean, we look at, we love, right? Because Peter did great things, but he was so clearly flawed. 
But then we have Paul, too, who was extremely flawed. You know, yeah, pick, pick a name, and, and you, can, you can find, generally speaking, a flaw in that person. I mean, there are a couple that you kind of look at and you go, man, I can't relate to this dude. You know, I, I'm thinking of Dan. I mean, this guy, where, where's the flaw? Where's the problem? You look, Joseph, then we're going to meet here pretty soon. Where's the flaw? Where, I, I can't relate to these guys. But actually, if you look closely enough at their lives, you can usually find that. Now, with Abraham, as we'll see, it's pretty much um, in full display. God doesn't hide uh, who Abraham is. And uh, what we're going to get eventually um, as we draw this picture of Abraham is the fact that he was walk with God. He was a man who had a perfect heart before God. He was a man who fought the good fight of faith and um, won. But he was also a man who was completely imperfect. And it's somebody that we can relate to. It's somebody that we can learn from. Can somebody um, hit that uh, cooler button there? I don't know about you, but it's, to me, it's starting to get pretty warm in here. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do, just uh, before we start to get into the Genesis, is read a summary of the life of Abraham. Not, not so much the life of Abraham, but kind of an outline of his faith and how his faith worked and how his faith operated. And we're going to go to the book of Romans. Okay, so Romans chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. says, therefore, it is of faith, talking about salvation, that it might be by grace. At the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, in other words, the Jews who were under the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made Abraham a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who makes alive the dead, or calls back the dead, and calls those things which are not as though they were. That's an amazing statement of faith. He calls those things that are not as though they were. Who, against hope, believed in hope, that he might be the father of many nations, which was spoken so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the death of Sarah's womb. He staggered not, he wasn't moved by, uh, not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now this is a summary of the life of Moses. Oh, wow, this guy was a, was a general of the faith. But it doesn't, it doesn't record his struggles. It only, it's only a summary telling you about the outcomes. But as we go back and we look through and read through 12 through 16, 12 through 17, we're going to see he, he, he had a lot of struggles with his faith. He, it wasn't like, okay, I believe it's done. No, as the years started to pass, he doubt. He expressed his doubts to God. And not only did he express his doubts to God, he got into situations that he opened the door to that uh, caused, him, caused him great pain, great difficulties in his life because his, his faith wasn't always so unshakable. Now, the, what, what you see here is that God doesn't look at only every particular instance that we're in judge us. He looks at a whole life lived before him. And as you look at a whole life lived before God, as you're passing through the tests and you're passing through the difficulties of life, those high, right, those heavy winds and so on and so forth, you might feel shaken at times. 
It was like Peter, he got out of the boat, right? He's walking on the water, but then he sees what? Wind and waves. Oh, man. Boy, he starts to sink. His faith, right, starts to deteriorate because of the circumstances and the situations that are upon him. Help, Lord, and the Lord helped him. Notice, Jesus didn't come back to the boat. Huh? He walked back to the boat. He came back. And it's like that for you and I. So when we get into these circumstances and situations where we feel shaken, maybe it's just a little bit of comfort, but know that you're not the only one. <laughs> the father of our faith, the great patriarch Abraham, who was a friend of God, of his steadfast faith in God, his persuasion of the promise of God, able to hold a and that phrase, I think, sums up his faith wonderfully. Hope against hope. What does it mean? It means that there was a supernatural hope that operated in his life that was against any lack of natural hope. In the natural, in his natural relationship with his wife, there was no hope for him to have a child. It was gone. The time had passed. But the promise made the opportunity a reality. The promise of God was what gave him the ability to hope, to continue hoping against a situation that was really hopeless. And many of us find ourselves in circumstances and situations where we feel like it's hopeless. There's no power, there's no one can bring the change that I want to see in this person's life situation, in this circumstance, whatever it may be. It's just hopeless. I'm, I'm just at, I'm at my end. Well, God's not. And the, and the thing is, is that generally speaking, when you and I get to our end, that's when God gets moving. But we have to hold on. We have to hold on. And this is the thing. You know, they, they, they tell us, you know, don't stir, you know, Hopes. I'm not stirring false hopes. I'm stirring true hopes. True hopes that are based upon the promises of God found in this book that multitudes of people have stood on and believed and found God to be true. Does it all work like the way we want it? No. Do things happen in our lives that we can't explain, that we wish had turned out? Yes. But because we know him, we can move on because we know him. We can continue to believe even though we don't understand the circumstances and the situations that occur. So this is what we see as a, as a, a result, as a summary of the, this, this tremendous uh, hero of faith. So that's, that's one of the things that, that, that I had already mentioned. Uh, without faith, without this element in our lives, without this faculty, this believing, it's impossible to please God. And if we abandon faith, <laughs> we get out of relationship with God. To Him, it's that important that we continue to believe always in the goodness of God. Like I say, there's, there are times that we can't explain the outcomes. We can't explain the things that are going on in our lives. But we have to, through our knowing of God, be able to affirm God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Regardless of it looks like it <laughs> or not. Yeah. Paul said we walk by faith and not by what? Sight. We walk by our hearts founded and established in this book and what has been spoken here. Not the circumstances that Amen? So Abraham, uh, this friend of God, very first meeting was put to the test. <laughs> God meets him, he says, Abraham, I want to establish a covenant with you. I want to be your God. I want to bless you. I want, to, I want, I want you to become a fountainhead of blessing for all the families of the earth. 
I'm just asking you to do one thing. Everything behind me and come follow me. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave all that you know behind, and I want you to follow me. Okay, God, I'll do it. Where are we going? I'll tell you when you get there. What? <laughs> immediately, he enters into friendship with God, and immediately God puts the test. He tried him. He tested him to see, would he obey? Would he do what he was asked to do? And after a short period of time, we discover that he was to the call. We don't really know exactly when God said that to him. It doesn't, it doesn't really say. It, it, it says God had said to him. Some translations put it in the past, put it in the present. In other words, that God had already spoken to him at this point, and that God was just waiting for him to do it. Perhaps he had some things he had to, you know, take care of. He had a large family, of course, and and uh, many servants, uh, uh, a great household. You know, he had he had many people that worked for him. Uh, would have been if you if you can think of a large working farm uh, today, have uh, 100, 100 employees, something like that. That's what Abraham would have been uh, watching over. And God wanted him to take all that, pack it all up, and <laughs> and live a nomadic life. In other words, go from place to place with all the all this stuff with away from your family. And how often God does that? He separates often from the influences of our of our past. He was the son of a man named Terah, who was uh, an idol worshiper, and probably Abraham uh, too was a worshiper of idols. But this man, he, he, Terah, did not know God. He didn't know uh, the one that his son would come to love and to know and to follow and, and to receive uh, great promises from. He had two brothers. One was Nahor and the other was Haran. And Haran had a son who, anybody know the name of Haran's son? Lot. Wow, somebody's doing their homework over there. Whew. Unnamed Lot. And Lot, of course, um, because Haran died, he hooked up with Abraham, and, and he went with Abraham on his journeys to a, to a particular point, right? He didn't follow him uh, forever, but he followed him. And of course, then we know that his, he also had a wife whose name was Sarai. Sarai. Sarah's later, right? Same situation, singular to the plural. So this Sarah. Sarah. She also came uh, to believe to put her trust in the Lord, to find God faithful. Because, I mean, we, we get to see not only Abraham's faith, but also the faith of Sarah, who had great struggles, you know, with the promises of God. That's the one when God gives you a promise, it, it brings you, and at some point it's going to lead you to a crisis. It's going, it's going to lead you to an internal crisis, a crisis of faith. Because you're going to get to a point where, God, when? God, how? God, how can this be? And we, we all cross those valleys. We all cross those, those little rivers in our lives. And, and we see the same thing in the life of Sarah. Sarai. So, in this first encounter um, with, with Abraham, God uttered promises that would completely change the course of his life and family. Completely change the course of his life and family. And I, if you were to look at your own life, that time when you believed on him and entered into relationship with him through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that covenant was established in your life, it altered the course that you were on. And many of us would say, thank you, Jesus. Because the course that I was on was not a good course. The course that I was on was leading to places that are not that are not good. Some of us had pasts that were not kosher, if I can put it that way. Some of us had pasts that were leading us uh, to not good places, and God intervened. Some of us were on good paths, paths that looked cheery. <laughs> Nonetheless, God altered in some way the course of your life. There isn't any true Christian who, when they give their life to the Lord, their life is not altered. It is altered. 
And in your walk with God, as you're faithful to Him, your life will constantly be altered. Not by your will or desire, but by His direction, by His Word, by what He wants for your life, what He has established for your life. And this is one of the things that, that he learns from God. Immediately He learns from God, wow, I have, I have put my life completely into His hands. Have you ever come to that realization, you know? We give our lives to the Lord. We think, oh, man, I'm getting, I'm getting out of a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and then the next thing we realize, our life doesn't belong to us anymore. And God starts to say things to us and really wants us to do certain things that would never have come into our heart and into our mind had it not been for our relationship with Him. And sometimes those things are Sometimes those things are scary. Sometimes those things we don't want to do. Let's just be honest about it. There are things God says to me that I don't want to do. I can say specific things that I did not want to do, but because I knew that God was in it. So God alters our direction. God alters the course of our lives. God altered drastically the course of the life of Abraham. In response, and this is one of the things uh, that really love uh, about Abraham. In response to this um, encounter with God, it, it brought Abraham to a place um, of worship. Let me, let me read from Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh in Shechem, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give the land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hill east of Bethel and pitched his with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued toward the Negev. What I want you to know is that when he moved from place to place, the first thing appears as though the first thing that he did wasn't to look for water, which would have been what a normal person, no, nomadic people would have done. The first, if you're going to plant yourself, the first thing you need is water, especially when you're in a desert. <laughs> but that wasn't what Abraham did. Abraham's life was ordered by God. Abraham was seeking first of God knowing that all the rest of it would be added unto him. So the first thing that he does is an altar. And what does he do with that altar? He offers sacrifice. It becomes his place of worship because we see from that the, the absolute priority of worshiping God first and foremost. At the beginning of the journey, in the middle of the journey, and as we will see, the final altar that we're going to encounter will be the greatest sacrifice anybody could ever possibly make. It was the greatest test a man could ever know. And we'll look at that altar next week. But he was accustomed to building altars before he ever got to that altar. He was accustomed to sacrificing. Them. And God, you know, God didn't start him with that sacrifice, <laughs> that great thing. He started him with, leave your family. He started with, follow me. He started with, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Do you believe me? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And it seems like, for the most part, Abraham was up to the task. He was following God. So he built this altar, and that became the focal point, the center, not only of Abraham's life, but also of his whole clan. He had a household full of servants. A house full, full of slaves, a house full, full of people that were born into his family through the relationships of the, of the servants and so on and so forth. But he was responsible for all of that. And it is certain that he communicated his faith, as we'll see later. So, Abram is this uh, marvelous example of faith, and obedience. A man who, when he heard clearly the directions of God, was able to walk with him. 
continue to be perfect and walk with God and fulfill God. But as I said before, he was not a man without faults. He had some very serious faults. Faults really that could have uh, led to uh, very dangerous circumstances, very dangerous situations. So, uh, but like I said, because we're so filled with shortcomings and flaws and imperfections, it really turns out that the weaknesses of, of our heroes of faith, these men that we want to follow, actually lead us in our walk with faith, give us encouragement. They let us know that, you know, it's not three strikes and you're out. God will deal with us with great patience, with great long suffering, and um, will, will correct us, but not abandon us. He will lead us on in the way. As we look at uh, Abraham, I th- I, you know, it's, he, he demonstrated something that is, is akin to uh, cowardice, right? The problem that Abraham ran into is the fact that his wife was beautiful. And he knew his wife was beautiful. And everybody else knew that his wife was beautiful. And in that world, it was going to create a problem for Abraham. Abraham to this area of fear because he knew that when he, because of the famine and so on and so forth, had to go to a more populated area, he knew who these leaders were. He knew that when when you came into an area that was not yours, you were going to be under the governance of the leader the of that, new, that other nomadic uh, land. And he knew that they were going to take from you what they wanted to take from you if you wanted to live by them. There was going to be a deal made. Do you understand? You, you weren't going to live in them and garnish from them their goods, their, all these different things, without there being a price. Right? This is, this is how history works. There was a price. And Abraham knew it. And Abraham knew they're going to see this woman... And they're going to take my head. So what does he do? He and well, he enters into really a a how would I say a a contract with his wife. He he actually gets her involved and says, "Look, I'll give you that, but they're going to take skin. You need to tell them that you're just my sister." Tell them that you're my sister. And if we tell them they're my sister, you'll go, you'll be fine. They'll treat you well. They'll take care of you. You'll be with the head man. You'll, your life will be fine. Just do me this favor. <laughs> you will spare my life. Now, I don't have any other word for it but cowardice. I, 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 I mean, who would do that? Who would do that? We're talking about a very serious flaw. He was leading his wife and, and really pushing her into sin. This, this, is, this is not nice. This is, this is horrible. And I'm not going to go into specific details about, about what we find here in, in chapter 13. But what we see is that God is, is, is merciful, <laughs> both to Abraham and Sarah, but also to the, the king of the... I believe it was Pharaoh. Yes, Pharaoh. He, he, he shut up all the wombs of, of, of all the women in Pharaoh's house. And they said, what's going on here? <laughs> they said, wait a minute. They looked back and said, it, when this woman got here... <laughs> All this stuff started to come upon us. So they went to Abraham. They knew, you know, there, there was a perception about them. They understood that there was, a, there was a moral problem in their midst. So they went to Abraham, and, they, and well, it sounds to me like they really went to Sarah and said, look, what's up? Who are you, and who is this guy? Because when they confronted Abraham, they just said to him, basically, look, why did you lie to us? <laughs> they didn't ask, why did you lie to us? This, this is your, well, she actually is my sister. She just happens to be married to me too. 
God spared everybody in that circumstance and every situation. You have to remember, Abraham and Sarai were marked. They were going to fulfill the will of God. They, they were, if you will, destined. When God entered into that covenant with him, what he had declared happened. And God did what he needed to do to work it out. Now, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, people that don't learn from mistakes, we, we, a little, right? A little daft. Amazingly, later in chapter 20, we'll find that he does the same thing again. It's almost as though he said, well, I know it was wrong. I know, you know, but I got away with it the first time. Certainly, God will intervene. I mean, I don't know if that went through his mind at all, or if the fear just overcame him again. I, I, I don't know. Nobody knows because we, we, it doesn't tell us. But the fact is, is that that root was... That root of fear, that root of cowardice, cowardice was still there in his heart. It had not been dislodged by the work of the Spirit of God in Abraham. It was still there. But Abraham, he was a man, like so many of us, of, of contradictions. You know, we, we, this is something that we find. In, in We find contradictions. Because we find a man who will be such a coward and then flip the page and we find him filling the heroic. Doing a heroic thing and then falling back for this again. One of the beautiful things that we see about Abraham is that we mentioned that he took Lot with him. Also had a family, a clan, uh, animal inheritance to care for. And it occurred during their sojourning, that there was strife between their workers. And the wonderful thing, we see such a selfless thing, where we, de- where we saw really the epitome of selfishness, Abraham. Look, tell him you're my wife to save my skin. That's what we call selfishness. I mean, it's just right there. It's selfish. Selfish and cowardice, right? But then we circumstance with his with his nephew to where there's strife and Abraham go to his nephew and say, look, I'm the elder here. The land is before us. You go to that corner. This is mine. That's what he could have done. That's what he could have done. He was the elder. <laughs> and it would have been respected in those times in the East. It would have been respected and Abraham and, and Lot would have just said, okay, <laughs> here I go. He didn't do that. We see such a selfless act on the part of Abraham that it just it just blows us away. It's his nephew and he says, "Look at the land. It's big. It's gorgeous. If you will go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you will go to the left, I will go to the right." In other words, it's your choice. You choose. Whatever you want. I'm giving you the preference. I don't owe you you owe me, but I'm going to give you the preference. Choose. So Lot looked and he said, hmm, this is very well watered over here. This is a very good land right over here. I think I'll take that one. There, uncle. Okay, go right ahead. Of course, one of the problems was close to a mysterious place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we'll learn next week, it didn't turn out too good for him there. So Abraham let him go. Let him go into, into that land. You know that there were confederacies uh, at that time, the different kings or the different leaders of these different clans or these nomadic clans. And some of them had become cities and, and so on and so forth. And they were governed. You know, they had their rulers. They had, you know, somebody um, in one way or another that was recognized as a leader. And enter into relationships or if you know if we use our, our, our 
current language, <laughs> alliances or treaties, right, to protect one another. And they would become trading partners and, you know, people from this city would trade from people of that city and they would have the goods that they want and so on and so forth. And all these things were set up just like we see today, right, in a much larger uh, manner, doing that in, in these areas. So Sodom, uh, you know, they had their confederacy, but there was a, a confederacy of other kings that looked at Sodom and said, eh, we can take them. They've got some things we need. We don't need them around, but we want their stuff. <laughs> so they came together and they attacked Sodom. And as, as we know, the story went, they, they ended up taking Lot. They ended up taking all of his stuff. They took all the women. They killed all the men, left all them there, except for the king. Uh, somehow he got away, probably fled. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Abraham, Abraham heard that his nephew was taken and all his stuff and all his family, his wives, his children, everything was taken. And the first thing, he, he doesn't even consider his own safety. He, nothing. He goes to the men that he's in confederacy with and he says, look, this is what happened. And immediately they say, let's go get him. And they, without any consideration whatsoever, apparently. They don't really know the force going to come but because Lot is in danger, they marshal their forces and they go after him. So what we see this incredible courage on the behalf of Abraham. And not only that, he overtakes them, enters into battle with them, defeats them, and brings back everything. And, and, and as they're coming back, it says that they, they come into contact with the kings of Sodom. And they enter into conversation. And uh, the king of Sodom says, take everything. Just give me the people back. Take, take all the stuff, all of our stuff. You, you won the victory. The pillage belongs to you. Take it. Keep it. And Abraham says, no. Again, just an absolutely selfless thing. But it had to do with something totally different. As you read the story, what you find out is the reason why Abraham wouldn't take a dime from this. He said, I'm not taking anything for you, from you. It's mine, as a matter of fact. <laughs> And he could have just said, what you, I don't need your permission, dude. Who are you? He said, I'm not taking a dime because I don't want anybody to ever say that you made me wealthy. It was a principle. Abraham knew that it was God that had called him out and was building him up and would eventually make him into a nation. And he's... He was concerned for one thing, and that was the glory of God. All that stuff, no, I don't want any of it. He did enter into a, a, a deal with them. They said, okay, these Confederate kings, these guys that went with me, give them their portion, give the men, you know, some, some food and some clothes, so on and so forth, but you take the rest. I don't want anything. So he did, he did that for the men that went with him because so, he didn't want to speak for them. You know, we see some real character here. We, we see a guy who's concerned about the people that are around him, except for his wife. <laughs> I just don't get you. The more I think, of, the more you talk, it's like, what was wrong with this guy? And uh, so anyway, he doesn't accept anything. But then, as he's on this journey, there's... Mysterious uh, person to meet him. And I want to talk just briefly about this individual. Let me find it here. Because I, what's that? 18? Yeah, that's it. So he's, he's finished that, and it says, I'll, I'll start with 17, just to read into it a little bit. After Abraham returned from de defeating Ked or Laomer, wow, 
And the king's allied Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Now listen to this. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. In other words, he gave him a tithe. Now, what I want you to see here is the fact that this, this prince comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Who is this guy? Matter of fact, you don't hear anything about him previous, and you won't hear anything about him after this, until we get all the way over to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, where it's revealed who this king actually is. And just to let you know, this king was actually Jesus who came down to meet him. Now, the one thing that this king lets Abraham know is you didn't gain that victory by your own strength, wisdom, or courage. I gave it to you. And, and, and when that sunk into Abraham, that's the reason why he gave him tithes. He gave God for the victory given to him. Now, that's the same reason why we honor God with our tithe today. We acknowledge and we recognize that it is God that gives us the strength, the wisdom, the understanding to get up every day, go to work, earn our living, and take a portion of that and return it to God in gratitude. Because that's what we see. Abraham was a man of great gratitude. Abraham was a man that recognized the hand of God, that recognized the power of God, that recognized that I owe this God. So he gave him a tithe. Regardless of where the, the uh, uh, came from. Some have condemned it, you know, and, 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 and said, well, no, that was the you know, practice of, of pain. Why he did that. Well, the only thing I can tell you is that Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, so if he received it, it's justified. And it's right in the eyes of God. It is a perfect thing that he did. One of the little hints in this passage that lets us know that it is the Lord Jesus Christ is by what he brings. If we look at the very first, if we look at verse 18, what does it say? Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is king of peace, right? Which is uh, obviously the title for Jesus. King brought out what? Two things. Bread and wine, the body and the blood, right? What we see here is Jesus prophesying the fact that he is going to come and he is going to give his flesh and his blood in covenant to save and to redeem mankind. Pass over that real quick, but when you understand who Melchizedek is and what he's doing with Abraham, who is a man that's living in covenant with God, and through Abraham's seed, this very Melchizedek is going to come to the world and give his own life, his flesh and his blood, to save, it starts to take on a little more meaning. It starts to take on a little wow. There's no mistake that it was bread and wine. It could have just Figs and fat. It's true. But he brought bread and wine because they were symbolic. Symbolic of the covenant. Symbolic of what he do. And what is, what is the meal that we do, that we take, partake of, to remember what Jesus did? Communion, right? And what's communion? Alternative of the blood and the body of Christ. We are these children of Abraham by faith. And as Abraham partook of that meal with Melchizedek, so do we partake of that meal who is Melchizedek. Of course, as a representation. Right? We're not, it's not, 
you know, in the, within the Catholic tradition, the the blood and, and the and the bread are trans substituted, <laughs> right? And actually, for them, it becomes the actual bread and the actual Christ. For us, it's not that way. For us, it's purely symbolic of the sacrifice uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see some tremendous things in this contradictory life, this life that is, from, from beginning to end, it's contradictory. Like I say, one moment, you know, this guy's a superstar. The next moment, you just want to kick him. You know, it's, it's like, who is this guy? What is his... But then you look at these other things, and you, and you look at God's dealing with him, and you look at how God, little by little, is, is he's like dropping these little hints to Abraham. He's this had an effect on Abraham. Abraham would have understood to a certain degree what was going on here. The meal given to him by this special eternal priest, as he's shown to be in chapter 7 of Hebrews. You, you would do well uh, to, to look at, at Hebrews chapter 7 and read and, and find how, how you know, a, a greater uh, story of this, of this Melchizedek, because I'm just giving you uh, just a brief point, but he partook, and he offered to God tithes. These, this is this is God and Abraham entering into and developing their friendship, developing their relationship, so that Abraham understands who God is. And there are times when God has to knock us off our horse, us to realize we're not the ones sitting on the throne. That it's him that is sitting on the throne. He is sitting on the throne, not us. And there's times when God has to put that in order in our lives or reorder our lives when it gets out of whack. And you say, why well, that doesn't happen with me. Well, it happens throughout history, right? One of the most famous ones when Jesus to the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation. He said, he said, you guys do this well, you do that well, you do this well, this there, but there's one thing I have against you. You've left your first love. You're full of works, but you don't love me. Reorder. Get the priority right. And God is reordering Abraham's step after some real missteps. Everything is coming back into order. He's starting to understand what the relationship with this God really means. And how faithful this God is and will be him. And, this, and you have to realize Sarah was, was observing all this too. And, and there's one, one comment that it makes in, in Hebrews 11.11 11 about Sarah is that she, she believed because she knew that God was faithful. Well, how did she know God was faithful? She knew God was faithful by seeing all the things that were done in the life of Abraham right, right next to her. And how he was being faithful to, to this man <laughs> who was so flawed. If anybody knew Abraham's flaws, it was her. Right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, really didn't even get into... Well... We'll skip that part, but um, not as important to the to the development here. Um, I have to I have to kind of skip quickly because we've, we're actually I can't believe the time how fast the time goes sometimes. But when we're looking at Abraham very quickly, we're going to realize that he he does run into. Even after all of this, there comes a time when, you know what, and a lot of times what occurs, and, and the reason why this crisis of faith occurs, is, be, is, is time, right? It's, it's all about delay. It's all about, I took this step in faith, and it hasn't happened. And so often in, in our life of faith, as the time approaches, there's an indication of spiritual activity. We call it sometimes spiritual warfare. Spiritual activity. And the thoughts come and the doubts come and the wonderings why come and all this stuff comes. What's going on here? And, and, and it just fog 
of doubt. We need clarification. And this is what, what happened in the life of Abraham. Even after all these things that, we, that he has seen, talking to God face to face, all this. And he still enters into this crisis of faith. And this is why I say, I love it. I love that God puts it on display for us so that when we come into these moments, we get a hint at least of what's going on and how we can come out of it. Or how, better said, how God lead us out of it. Let me just read a little bit. I'm uh, just condense some, some things. I already told Abram uh, several times that his seed would multiply come many nations in the earth. But delays seem to have caused him to question the intent of God about the matter. At this juncture, God appeared to Abraham in a dream and assured him that he was with him and that he, he himself, God himself, was his great re reward. He, he would be his reward, right? So the thing that I want you to see, Abraham was getting out of whack. Right, I just I just mentioned it, but this is just another evidence of it. He was he was so focused on and obsessed with the idea of the seed that God was being put into the background. In other words, his relationship with God was being in the background, and the main thing was becoming for Abraham the answer to the the the, the promise. In other words, the 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 fact of of the promise coming into being. Abraham was getting lots of different things out of whack at this. Uh, particular time. So God, at this juncture, at this appearing in a, in a dream to Abraham, was setting Abram's heart in order again. Abram seems to have become obsessed about the promised seed, but God wanted him to know that he was the most important thing in their friendship and not the promised seed. Affirmation is proof positive of his obsession. So after Abraham, after God appears to him, of worshiping God as he would have normally, Abram brings up the fact that he doesn't see the seed. Okay, you tell me that you're with me. That's nice. Where's the seed? And, and this is one of the things that you see about Abraham. He's very frank with God. You know, some of us, we want to tiptoe around things when we're talking to God. I don't think God appreciates it. I think God appreciates plain speaking. Just plain speaking, not arrogance, not foolishness for sure, not presumption, a pouring out of the heart before him. And it doesn't have to be with minced words. Very direct question. Where's the seed? Because what Abraham basically said is, what's the use of all the rest of this without the seed? And the, and the thing that we notice is God doesn't go, Ha! Oh, how dare you speak to me in such tones? He didn't even mention it. He just took it in stride. It wasn't disrespect. If it hadn't been disrespect, I to you, the, the, the bolt would have been released and he would have been toast. I can get another one of you. <laughs> But God apparently accepted his frankness, even though it was froth with doubt. But it seems as though Abraham was after answers. It seems as though Abraham was pro that it was not unbelief, that it was actually faith <laughs> being really, look, you spoke to me. When Little did he know it was going to be even 13 years more. <laughs> From this point of affirmation, God sometimes man just blows me away. It's like, really? So instead of worshiping, he brings this up in a few words. He says, "What's the point without the seed?" Because he's patient and merciful, God assured Abraham, and I and I love this. He he clearly told him that it would come out of your own bowel. He said, what he said to God was, "The only heir that I have is this Eliezer, this servant of mine, and he's going to get all my stuff." He's going to become the heir. And God will say, no, that's not what's going to happen. You're actually going to have a son. I know you're getting older. <laughs> I know it's becoming more difficult. <laughs> I know what's up. I know what you're seeing. 
but he affirmed in, in firm but very uh, gentle uh, way, and, and it really encouraged Abraham. And it seems to have settled Abraham's heart. He seems to have accepted that because at right, God counted it to him for righteousness. So God knew that his heart was hooked. God knew that Abraham was in. God knew that he was in at that point. <laughs> and then, and then, and this is the thing we have with Abraham. He does these wonderful things. We see this communication. We see this relationship. It's tremendous. And then, Sarah's getting antsy. I'm old. You're old. We're worn out. It ain't happening. Look, maybe you still got the stuff, but I don't have it. I'm dry. I'm done. I don't, I don't even want a baby at this point. Are you kidding me? Take my maid. Look, she's beautiful. Take her. Perhaps God will give me children by her. And Abraham did. Now, the ramifications of this were going to be great. Of course, they didn't know that at that point. They just thought they were going to get a child, and that was going to be the child of promise, and this child was going to grow up, and it would be Abraham and Sarah's child, and so on and so forth. Our complications. The first one was, you just sinned. And not only did you two, in cahoots, sin together, you also caused Hagar sin. You brought her into your little scheme. And she had to because, well, you own her. <laughs> you caused her to sin before me. Now, it was perfectly normal at that time for that to happen. Culturally speaking, it happened. But these two knew the plan of God regarding marriage. These two knew that God had promised them, you're going to have a child. You two are going to have a child. In the normal, natural way of a man with a woman, you're going to have a child. That spelled it out. And Sarah just got tired and said, look, just de de be done with it. And they did the deed, and there was a child born, and his name is Ishmael. And that name has renown to this day. Every time we do something out of the timing of God, every time we get out ahead of God, we say, well, there's my Ishmael. Why? Because Ishmael is representative of people who can't wait. The results of what occurs becomes known as your Ishmael. General culture. <laughs> you know, except for millennials, maybe. But everybody beyond that would understand, you know, oh, there's your Ishmael. You, you jumped out ahead. You got ahead of things. And things occur, and, and this is the result now. Well, that's exactly what happened. And so we have this situation. And one of the things that Sarah never could have imagined is, is that when, when Hagar got uh, pregnant, she got arrogant, too. She said, <laughs> I got to, I'm the head of the household now. It says that Sarah was despised in the eyes of Hagar. The word despised means it means to not take into account, to not consider. In other words, she struck her down as far as being an authority in her life. She was trying to supplant Sarah. She was trying to play, take Sarai's place. She thought <laughs> that she was going to become the mother. And Sarah was upset. Let's, let's read just real quickly. Very interesting thing. So in chapter 16, uh, at the end of verse Two, it says, Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering, the wrong that we have done. You're the responsible one. And, and she's right. Why? 
Because Abraham should have simply said, woman, that's not what we're going to do. Remind you of anybody? Adam and Eve, maybe? Kind of the same situation going on here, right? But the man should have taken his place of authority in the family and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to wait. Abraham just wanted to take an easy way out. Contradiction. Contradict. This guy is so full of contradiction. It's absolutely It's amazing. You're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms. I like this. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. And look what she said. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, why does she say that? Sarah is off about one thing and isn't going to let it go. She's ticked off, not about the sin that they committed. She's ticked off about Hagar's attitude. And she comes to Abraham and she says to Abraham, you wimp. You know what's going on here. You being the, fam the, the head of this family, step in and put her in her place. Why are you not correcting my servant girl? She's not going to let it go. <laughs> She's not going to have this girl prodding her for the rest of her life. Despising her, treating her as less than what she is. How do we know that? Look at verse 6. Abraham simply says to her, your servant is in your hands. That's what she wanted. That's what Sarah wanted. You give me her to deal with this girl because this will go no longer. I will not put up with this in my house. And Abraham said, she's in your hands. Do with her what you want. And of course, <laughs> you know, putting somebody in an um, uh, angry woman's grasp, and she was right to be about what, you know, Hagar was doing. She treated her harshly. So harshly that it says that Hagar fled. And it's a beautiful story. She fled, right? But God followed her. <laughs> God followed her. I said, no, this, this has a seed from my friend Abraham. God followed her, sent an angel out to her, and the angel finds her in the desert and says, so what you doing out here? Well, my mistress, she treated me harshly, so I fled. I left. She humiliated me in front of everybody. I left. I couldn't stand it anymore. I was in the right. I couldn't take it. And the angel said to her the one thing that she didn't want to hear. <laughs> Go back. Humble yourself under her hand. And I will bless your seed as well. And I will make nations your seed as well. She had to humble herself. See, that's what it was all about right there. That's why, that's why Abraham was so, so or, or Sarah was so upset with Abraham. You're not putting our house in order. You're allowing this household to get out of order. Put it back into order. Be a man. He said, okay. This wimpiness. Okay, yeah, you take care of it. <laughs> Abraham should have just walked up to her and said, look, you're with child, my child, but you aren't my wife. Nothing more. He should have made that clear. And he shouldn't have put her into Sarah's hands. <laughs> he knew what she was going to do. But in the midst of it, Hagar garnered a blessing. She garnered a blessing. Because even though she had to humble herself and go back in those circumstances and those situations, what she said was, God has looked.